Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Um, special thanks to Professor Mezzi for making this happen. Uh, and thank you also to the American Criminal Law Review for hosting me today. Uh, I've relied on the American Criminal Law Review for years. <laughs> so um, it's really wonderful to get to come here and speak in this context. So uh, I'm talking today about my new book, but in some more fundamental sense, I am talking about features of our criminal justice system that we rarely discuss. And snitching is everywhere in our criminal system. What do I mean by snitching? I'm referring to the very specific law enforcement practice of trading criminal guilt in exchange for information. Uh, and so uh, this talk in this book is not about everyone who gives information to the government. It's not about the citizen who calls 911. It's not about even informants who work for money, although many do. But it's about the specific public policy of permitting the trade of potential criminal guilt in exchange for information and cooperation. And I say snitching is everywhere in our criminal system in the following sense. It touches on and bears on almost every facet of the criminal process as we know it. It takes place on street corners when a police officer has to decide whether to pressure a suspect into cooperating or whether to arrest them at that moment. It takes place in jails and prisons where inmates know that if they come forward with information, they may get a deal. Uh, it takes place, of course, in, in prosecutorial offices when prosecutors have to decide which suspect should be the witness and which one should be the defendant in any particular case. Uh, it shapes uh, FBI investigations and other uh, federal and local and state uh, law enforcement investigations. Of course, it's a central feature of plea bargaining as we know it. And uh, especially in the federal system, it's an, a, a crucial feature of sentencing, the decision of how much, if any, credit uh, a defendant should get for any cooperation they have rendered to the government. So it is in this sense that snitching is part of almost every piece of the criminal justice system. And this has deep implications for our legal system. It affects how we investigate crime. Uh, it, in fact, it affects who gets investigated for crimes. It affects how we decide who is guilty and what they're guilty of and how they should be punished. And it affects people's perceptions of the legal system and their understanding of how law enforcement works. I'd like to start uh, today the way I start the book, with a true story. Ninety-two-year-old Catherine Johnston was dead, which meant big trouble for officers Smith and Junior. Three hours earlier, everything had looked so promising. Atlanta police had busted Fabian Sheets for the third time in four months, and the local drug dealer turned informant had tipped them off to a major stash at 933 Neal Street, an entire kilo of cocaine. Sheets wasn't one of their registered informants, so they couldn't use him to get a warrant. But Smith and Junior applied for a warrant anyway by inventing an imaginary snitch. They called him a, quote, reliable confidential informant, unquote, and they told the magistrate judge that this non-existent snitch had bought crack cocaine at the Neal Street address. Well, the fabrication wouldn't matter in the end. After they got the warrant, busted in, and grabbed the kilo, it would be a major victory. But nothing went the way it was supposed to. Sheets' tip was bad. There was no cocaine at that address. Once inside the house, the officers opened fire. And now Mrs. Johnston was lying at their feet, riddled with police bullets, with no cocaine anywhere to be found. So Smith and Junior turned to one of their regular informants, yet another snitch named Alex White. They offered him 130 bucks to say that he'd bought drugs at Mrs. Johnston's Neal Street home and to corroborate their false warrant application. It wouldn't bring Mrs. Johnston back, but at least no one would learn that they'd gambled everything on a weak lead from a bad snitch and that the informant in the warrant didn't even exist. I start with this story uh, not only because it's true and not only because it triggered a congressional investigation, which it did, uh, but because it's paradigmatic in many ways of the snitching phenomenon. 
The story begins, of course, with the police letting a known criminal offender walk in exchange for information, and this is the heart of the snitching deal. Uh, it is precisely in this way that many criminal informants are able to avoid liability for their crimes by providing information, and as it, as it was in this story, all too often this information is inaccurate. The Atlanta police used their informant power both to rely on an unreliable snitch and to invent an informant to get a warrant because they knew with near certainty that their decision to do so would never be scrutinized by a court. It is rare for a magistrate judge to require uh, police to verify the identity or the, or the information from a confidential informant. And so although, as you know, we have many mechanisms for uh, ensuring the, the accuracy of information in warrants, often criminal informant use slips beneath, beneath this protective radar. And finally, police in this story used their informant power to cover up their own mistake. And because informant use is so secretive and is so unregulated, it is easy for police and prosecutors to use informants in many ways to fill in gaps, to bolster shaky cases, to get a questionable warrant, and even to cover up errors, mistakes, or even wrongdoing on their own part. And so it is in this way that the tragedy of Mrs. Johnston's death tells us something about how our criminal system really works. I started by describing how criminal informant use touches on so many facets of our criminal justice system. But do we know more than that? Can we estimate how many criminal informants there really are in our, criminal, in our system at any given time? And the first thing that needs to be said is, is that there is no direct data. Uh, there are no mechanisms uh, to collect data on how many informants police and prosecutors create and rely on at any given time, what crimes they've committed, what crimes they've helped us solve. Uh, but we can piece together a more robust picture from data that we do know about how our criminal system works. And so one useful piece of data that people often turn to in this regard is federal sentencing data. Our, the, the Sentencing Commission tells us that approximately 13 or 14 percent of all federal defendants receive some cooperation credit on the record in the form of a sentencing departure at sentencing, and about a quarter of drug defendants do. Uh, the Sentencing Commission also tells us that it believes that about half of cooperating defendants actually get credit for their cooperation. So if 25 percent of federal drug offenders actually get a sentencing departure, uh, that means probably about 50 percent or somewhat more of drug defendants are actually cooperating. It's just that about half of them don't show up in the sentencing data. The Sentencing Commission also tells us that in every category of federal offense, criminal defendants receive cooperation credit from child pornography to murder as well as sort of the heartland cases of uh, drugs and increasingly fraud and white collar crime. So the entire federal criminal system is touched in these various ways uh, by, the, um, uh, by the power to turn a defendant into a cooperator. The problem with this data is that it's partial in any number of ways. First of all, uh, it doesn't include um, most of the cooperation that we know about. Uh, it's in, in effect, it's the tip of the iceberg. Of course, it doesn't include defendants who cooperate but don't get credit. But it doesn't include all those defendants who avoid being arrested or prosecuted in the first place by cooperating. It doesn't account for dropped charges or other benefits that cooperators might get, as well as a host of other kinds of benefits, such as immigration consideration and, of course, uh, money and other payments. So it is, at best, a partial picture of cooperation in the federal system. And the federal system is actually quite a small percentage of our entire criminal justice system. It represents about a tenth of felony cases. Ninety percent of all cases take place at the state level. So for what it's worth, the federal, uh, uh, the federal data gives us a glimpse, but a very partial one. We can, however, more generally uh, use drug enforcement itself as a rough proxy for figuring out how prevalent the use of criminal informants really is in our system. Because we know that informant use is at the heart of drug investigations, negotiations, plea bargaining, and sentencing. Uh, it's sometimes 
suggested that every drug case involves a snitch. But anybody who's worked in the criminal justice system knows that it is par for the course for any, any number of the parts of, of a drug investigation to rely on or involve informants in some way. Well, that's about 30% of our criminal justice system.